The Book of the Prophet Nahum. This short prophetic book is a collection of poems announcing the downfall of one of Israel's worst oppressors, the ancient empire of Assyria, and its capital city, Nineveh. The Assyrians arose as one of the world's first great empires, and their expansion into Israel resulted in the total destruction and exile of the northern kingdom and its tribes. The Assyrian armies were violent and destructive on a scale that the world had never seen before, and so Israel and its neighbors were awaiting the downfall of Assyria, which eventually came in the year 612 BC. The Babylonians rose up and began a rebellion that overtook Nineveh and brought down the Assyrian Empire. And so chapter 2 depicts the fall of Nineveh in vivid poetry, and chapter 3 then explores the downfall of the empire as a whole. But this book isn't just an angry tirade against Israel's enemies. The introductory chapter shows us that there is way, way more going on here. The book opens with an incomplete alphabet poem that begins by describing a powerful appearance of God's glory. It's very similar to how the previous book, Micah, began and how the next book, Habakkuk, is going to conclude. And it's God, the all-powerful creator, coming to confront the nations and bring his justice on their evil. And the poem opens by quoting from the famous line of God's self-description after the golden calf incident in the book of Exodus chapter 34. The Lord is slow to anger. He's great in power. He won't leave evil unpunished. And so the rest of the poem goes back and forth, contrasting the fate of the arrogant, violent nations with the fate of God's faithful remnant. When God brings down all the arrogant empires, he will provide refuge for those who humble themselves before him. Now, here's what's really interesting, is that you thought this book was only about Assyria, but Nahum actually nowhere mentions Nineveh or Assyria in chapter 1. And when he describes the downfall of the bad guys, he uses Isaiah's language about the fall of Babylon, which happened much later in history. And not only that, Nahum also describes the downfall of the bad guys as good news for the remnant of God's people. It's a direct allusion to Isaiah's good news about the downfall of Babylon. And so all these little details from chapter 1, they come together to make a key point. For Nahum, the fall of Nineveh is being presented as an example, as an image of how God is at work in history in every age, how he won't allow the arrogant or violent empires of our world to endure forever. And so the message of Nahum is actually very similar to that of Daniel. Assyria stands in a long line of violent empires throughout history. And Nineveh's fate is a memorial to God's commitment to bring down the violent and the arrogant in every age. With this perspective from the opening chapter, the book then returns to its focus on Assyria. And so chapter 2 describes the Battle of Nineveh and the overthrow of the city in progressive stages. So first we see the front line of Babylonian soldiers, and then we read about the charge of the chariots, and then the chaos on the city walls as the city is breached, then the slaughter of Nineveh's people, then the plundering of the city. Chapter 3 goes on to describe the results of the city's downfall for the empire as a whole. So Nahum begins by announcing a woe upon the city whose kings built it with the blood of the innocent. It's an image of how injustice was built into the very system that made Assyria so successful. But their violence has sown the seeds of their own destruction, and so Assyria will fall before Babylon. The book concludes with a taunt against the fallen king of Assyria. He's stricken with a fatal wound, and from among all the nations that he once oppressed, no one comes to help him. Rather, they sing and celebrate his destruction. And that's how the book ends. Now, this is a gloomy book, but it's important to see how Nahum's message addresses the tragic and perpetual cycles of human violence and oppression in every age. Human history is filled with tribes and nations elevating themselves and using violence to take what they want, resulting in the death of the innocent. And the book of Nahum uses Assyria and Babylon as examples to tell us that God is grieved and that he cares about the death of the innocent and that his goodness and his justice compel him to orchestrate the downfall of oppressive nations. And God's judgment on evil is good news, unless, of course, you happen to be Assyria. Which brings us all the way back to the conclusion of that opening poem in chapter 1, which tells us that the Lord is good and a refuge in the day of distress. He cares for those who take refuge in him. And so the little book of Nahum invites every reader to humble themselves before God's justice and to trust that in his time he will bring down the oppressors of every time and place.
And that's what the book of Nahum is all about. Route 66. Today we continue our journey through the Bible from the book of Genesis through the book of Revelation. We are cruising through these 66 books, generally one book each Sunday. And this morning we are ready to study the book of Nahum. So let's just dive right on in, beginning with the structure. How does the book of Nahum fit into the overall structure of the Old Testament? Well, as we've noted throughout this series, there are 39 books in the Old Testament divided into three main sections, historical, poetical, and prophetical. Nahum is the 12th book in the third section, the prophetical books, the seventh book of the 12 minor prophets, and the 34th book overall. In Nahum 1 and verse 1, we read a prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. And so the book of Nahum was authored by Nahum himself. The Hebrew word Nahum means comfort or consolation. It's actually a shortened form of the name Nehemiah. This is the only record of Nahum in all of the Bible. Unlike the other prophets, he's never mentioned in any of the Old Testament books of history, nor is he quoted at all in the New Testament, but certainly that does not lessen the importance of Nahum's prophetic words. Again, verse 1 tells us he is the Elkoshite, referring to his place of birth or his hometown. Where exactly Elkosh was located is uncertain. Some have suggested that it was an earlier name for the city of Capernaum on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum literally means city of Nahum, literally Capernaum in Hebrew. So perhaps Elkosh was renamed Capernaum in Nahum's honor. And that would make Nahum then a prophet of the northern kingdom of Israel. However, most conservative scholars believe that Elkosh was a city in the southern kingdom, later called Elkasi, between Jerusalem and south of there toward Gaza. And that would make Nahum a prophet of the southern kingdom of Judah and would probably more uh, makes sense because of his keen interest in the triumph of Judah throughout this book. Now verse 1 also tells us that Nahum is, is a prophecy concerning Nineveh. More to the point, the book of Nahum is largely about the fall of Assyria and its capital city, Nineveh. Now you'll recall that our study of the book of Jonah was about the repentance of the Ninevites. In fact, Jonah 3 and verse 5 told us the Ninevites believed God, a fast was proclaimed, and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. And everyone, king and even the animals, repented. They turned from their sin and they turned to God. And then Jonah 3 and verse 10 tells us that when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had promised. Next slide. That was all in 760 B.C., this, the book of Nahum, is exactly 100 years later in 660 B.C. Obviously, the revival of Nineveh was short-lived, <laughs> and the Assyrians soon returned to their habits of violence, idolatry, and arrogance. And as a result, Nahum prophesies that Babylon will so destroy the city that no trace of it will even remain. Now, what makes Nahum's prophecy so remarkable is that by the time of Nahum, Assyria had reached the peak of its prosperity and power. Nineveh was at this time the mightiest city on the face of the earth with walls. 
a hundred feet high all the way around it and wide enough to accommodate three chariots riding abreast of each other. Along the wall were huge towers that stretched an additional a hundred feet higher. In addition, the walls were surrounded by a moat 150 feet wide and 60 feet deep. In the culture of that day, Nineveh was impregnable. It could withstand a 20-year siege with no problem whatsoever. And so Nahum's prophecy of Nineveh's downfall seems highly unlikely. And yet Nahum 1 and verse 8 tells us, With an overwhelming flood, he, God, will make an end of Nineveh. And that's precisely what took place. The Tigris River overflowed its banks, and the flood destroyed part of Nineveh's walls. The Babylonians then invaded through that breach in the wall. They plundered the city, and they set it on fire. Nahum also predicted that you will go into hiding, Nahum 3.11. More accurately, you will be hidden and true to that prediction, after its destruction in 612 B.C., the site of the city of Nineveh was not rediscovered until 1842 A.D., 2,500 years later. They did disappear. Now, Nahum is one of three prophets who primarily focused on the judgment of Judah's enemies. The other two are Obadiah, we've already studied, who focused on the Edomites, Esau's descendants. And then Habakkuk, that we'll study the next lesson, who focuses on the Babylonians. So with that overall structure in mind, then let's move on to the story. And once again, we are certainly indebted to the Bible Project for their excellent overview of the storyline of Nahum in the video that we watched to begin today's lesson. And as usual, I have reproduced the Nahum chart across the inside pages of your notes for your own further study at home. Now, as a prophecy concerning Nineveh, I found that Nahum is easily remembered under three chapter headings, beginning first with the destruction of Nineveh is decreed. Chapter 1 the destruction of Nineveh is decreed. Nahum begins with a very clear description of the character of the Lord, Adonai, Yahweh. And notice verses 2 and 3. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on His foes and vents His wrath against His enemies. The Lord is slow to anger but great in power, the Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. Don't miss that last phrase. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. Even though the Lord is slow to anger, even though the overall prophetic message uh, there in Nahum 1 verse 7 is that the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. Even though that is true, the, the real key to this prophetic message in chapter 1 is summed up in the phrase, the Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. He's decreed it to be so. The Lord has given a command concerning Nineveh, I will prepare your grave. Boy, how would you love to get those words from the Lord? I will prepare your grave, for you are vile. And chapter 1 ends, they will be completely destroyed. And so the, the, the destruction of Nineveh is decreed, which brings us to the second chapter, and that is the destruction of Nineveh is described. In Nahum chapter 2, it's a very vivid description. It begins by contrasting the fates of Assyria, Nineveh, and Jacob, Judah, or Jerusalem. In fact, the, the verse says, An attacker advances against you, Nineveh. And com contrast that then with, The Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob. And then the balance of chapter 2 is Nahum's description of the siege and the sack of this supposedly impregnable city of Nineveh. This is one of, by the way, the most vivid 
portraits of battle in the entire Bible. The storming warriors and, and chariots can almost be seen and heard as they are described entering the city through the breach in the wall. And as the Ninevites flee in terror, Nineveh is like a pool whose water is draining away. She is pillaged, plundered, stripped, hearts melt, knees give way, bodies tremble, every face grows pale. And Nineveh is burned up and cut off forever. The destruction of Nineveh is described. Which brings us to the third chapter, and that is the description of Nineveh is deserved. The destruction of Nineveh is deserved, Nahum chapter 3. He closes this brief book of judgment with God's reasons for why Nineveh was going to have this downfall. Now earlier I asked you to turn in your Bibles to Nahum chapter 3, and so follow along now as I read the first seven verses in this chapter. Nahum chapter 3, we pick it up with verse 1. Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims, the crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses and jolting chariots, charging cavalry, flashing swords and glittering spears, many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses, all because of the wanton lust of a prostitute, that's Nineveh, alluring the mistress of sorcerers, sorceries who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will pelt you with filth. I will treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. And all who see you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is in ruins. Who will mourn for her? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? Who will mourn for her? And the implied answer is, no one. <laughs> because Nineveh was a city full of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims because of Assyria's <clears throat> prostitution, sorceries, and witchcraft. God says, I am against you. Simply put, Nineveh's cruelty and corruption brought God's judgment upon them. They deserved God's anger and wrath. And no one, especially Judah, would mourn. For her. In fact, the book of Nahum ends, Nothing can heal you. Your wound is fatal. All who hear news about you clap <laughs> at your fall. For who has not felt your endless cruelty? The destruction of Nineveh is deserved. And so Nahum prophesies about the destruction of Nineveh. It's decreed in chapter 1, described in chapter 2, and found deserved in chapter 3. That's the story of Nahum. Which brings us then to the Savior. Each Sunday as we focus on one of the 66 books of the Bible, one of our priorities is to point out where and how Jesus is to be found in the narrative of that book. Now please remember, there is but one grand central theme that runs all through all 66 books of the Bible, from Genesis through Revelation, and that is salvation through God's Son, Jesus Christ. And so here in Nahum... We want to stop and look and listen for the Savior. Where and how does Jesus Christ appear in the book of Nahum? Well, the answer is found in Nahum 1 and verse 15. Look there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Now, if that verse sounds a little bit familiar, it's because we read a similar verse just a few lessons ago from Isaiah 52 and verse 7. In fact, let's read this verse out loud together. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. And what is this good news or glad tidings that's being brought? What is this peace that is being proclaimed? It's the good news 
of the Messiah, the Christ. It's the salvation that only comes through the Savior, Jesus. It is the peace that was made for us on the cross. The Apostle Paul put it this way, Ephesians 2. For Christ himself is our way of peace. By his death, he ended the angry resentment between us, and he has brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were very far away from him and to us Jews who were near. And now all of us, whether Jews or Gentiles, may come to God the Father because of what Christ has done for us. By the way, don't forget, this good news is meant to be shared. Romans 10, verses 14 and 15 remind us, but how shall they ask Him to save them unless they believe in Him? How can they believe in Him if they have never heard about them? And how can they hear about Him unless someone tells them? This is what the Scriptures are talking about when they say, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace with God and bring glad tidings of good things. In other words, how welcome are those who come preaching God's good news. It's our joyous privilege and responsibility to bring good news, to proclaim salvation, to preach the gospel of peace with God. That's the Savior, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Which brings us then to our final point, which is the sense. As we wrap up every lesson, I want to offer the sense of the books of the Bible. In other words, what practical take-home lessons can we apply to our daily lives from the book? In today's case, what instructions or applications can we glean from this little book of Nahum? Well, would you please read Hebrews 4 and verse 12 out loud with me? For the Word of God is alive and powerful... It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Talking about the Word of God. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the sense of Nahum is kind of like a two-edged sword. This book of prophecy cuts both ways, reminding us first that the guilty will not go unpunished, and then second, that the godly will not go unrewarded. So let's kind of take that apart. Let's look at this two-edged application. Number one, the guilty will not go unpunished. One of the odd realities about living under a just God is that we inevitably seem to get away with some sin. That is, there are some, if not many, sins for which there appears to be no immediate consequence, either large or small. We just seem to get away with it. Certainly from time to time we do get caught, but on the whole, there are no immediate consequences. No lightning bolt strikes us dead when we lie or cheat or gossip or overeat or feel pride. We might feel a little bit of shame, but from all appearances, we don't even get punished. Unlike the child who gets caught with his or her hand in the proverbial cookie jar, we don't get our hands slapped for most of our sins. And the more we sin and go unpunished, the more we assume we can just get away with it. Oftentimes, we'll just manage our sin so we don't want to commit the big ones, you know, murder and blasphemy and so on. That way, we, ra we rationalize we're not too bad, and therefore God might just forgive us for all those little trifling sins that we commit. Now, that is exactly the kind of thinking that Nahum addresses in his book of prophecy. In the opening chapter, Nahum communicates a critical point about God's justice that otherwise might escape our notice and experience. We've already looked at it, Nahum 1 verse 3, the Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. 
Nahum defines a clear and unchangeable reality about all sin, great or small, God will punish all of it. Indeed, it's necessary for God to punish every guilty person for every wrongdoing. Otherwise, He would not be just. He would be like maybe one of our own corrupt judges who allow the guilty to go unpunished. But God must be thoroughly just in order for Him to be God. And Nahum underscores this truth. He will not at all acquit the wicked, and will by no means allow the guilty to go unpunished. Now, if that's true, why then do we think that we can get away with sin? Well, probably the greatest contributor to that has to do with God's patience. Earlier in Am 1 verse 3, he writes, The Lord is slow to anger. Now, we've talked about that before in other prophets, haven't we? Lord is slow to anger. The downside of God's patience is that we can easily misconstrue His patience with His unwillingness to deliver consequences. And every time we sin, and there's a long time lag between our actions and some consequence, or the apparent lack of any consequence, this mentality seems to get confirmed. And we somehow begin to think that we are the exception to God's justice. That will go unpunished. Paul addresses this error in Romans chapter 2. And we know that God in His justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that His kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Like Nahum, Paul wants the church at Rome to understand that because of their sin, they will not escape the judgment of God. To suppose such a thing is wrong. To further his argument, Paul rebukes the Romans for misunderstanding God's character by minimizing his judgment simply because he's also patient and forbearing. And thus, in our depravity, we view his being slow to anger as an occasion to go ahead and sin. But his patience does not eliminate his justice. It's the expression of his patience. This part of his character, that is, as we just read in this verse, intended to turn you from your sin. The guilty will not go unpunished. Those who have not repented of their sin and have not trusted in Jesus as their sin bearer have no hope of pardon as they perversely adhere to their own devices, including presuming that they will somehow escape God's judgment. And Nahum's message to Nineveh and us is that we are deceived, for God will not pass by any sin without certain and complete punishment. God demonstrated this truth by decimating the Assyrians only a hundred years after He had given them time to repent under Jonah. Therefore, may we repent of our sins as we progressively yield our wills to Jesus Christ in each and every area of our lives. And may the fact that we sin remind us each time that every one of these sins will not go unpunished. They must be punished in order for God to be a just God. Thus, when we repent of our sins, may we recognize that this is exactly why we need a Savior. We need a substitute to take the punishment that we justly deserve. And it is this punishment that Jesus himself willingly bore on our behalf on the cross because of his infinite, kind, and just love. Amen. Amen. And so, first, the guilty will not go unpunished. Now, I said there's a flip side. There's a two-edged sword here. So the other edge of the sword is that the godly will not go unrewarded. 
The godly will not go unrewarded. The book of Nahum is a book about God's justice, and justice is two-edged. But with verses like Nahum 1 and verse 6, who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. Or Nahum 1 verse 14, I will prepare your grave for you are vile. Or Nahum 3 verse 5, I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. Or Nehemiah 3 and verse 19, nothing can heal you, your wound is fatal. Now with verses like that, we could be very easily focused on just the one edge of God's justice, and that's that the guilty will not go unpunished. But there's a second edge to God's justice, and that is that the godly will not go unrewarded. Verses like Nahum 1 and verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger. Or Nahum 1 and verse 7, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in Him. Or Nahum 1 verse 12, although I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no more. Or Nahum 1 verse 15, look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Or Nahum 2 verse 2, the Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob. We must not miss the flip side of Nahum's prophecy. That is, the godly will not go unrewarded. Because that too is a part, you see, of God's justice. As we've read from nearly every prophet we've studied so far, it seems like there's always two parts to these prophetic books. The first is condemnation. The second is consolation. The first is retribution. The second is restoration. The first is judgment. The second is hope. The godly will not go unrewarded. Those who have repented of their sin and have trusted in Jesus as their sin bearer have the hope of pardon. And of course, this is not of our own doing. It is not of our own merit. No, it's entirely because of God's amazing grace. Paul put it this way, Ephesians 2, All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The the godly will not go unrewarded. God's grace assures us that because we have by faith received His gift of salvation through Christ. I want us to read a a few verses here from Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. Let's read this out loud together. It's a little long, but I think you can hang with me in it. You yourselves are a case study of what He does. At one time, you all had your backs turned to God, thinking rebellious thoughts of Him, giving Him trouble every chance you got. But now, by giving Himself completely at the cross, actually dying for you, Christ brought you over to God's side and put your lives together, whole and holy, in His presence. You don't walk away from a gift like that. You stay grounded and steady in that bond of trust, constantly tuned into the message, careful not to be distracted or diverted. There is no other message, just this one. Yeah, it's just this one. That's it. And if you have not embraced this message, 
If you have not yet personally received this gift of salvation, if you have not yet decided to accept Christ's finished work on the cross for you, let me urge you, do not delay another moment. Do it today. In fact, Jesus himself extends this invitation to you. He says, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. Come, let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes to take the free gift of water of life. He's, he's saying, he's pleading with you. His arms are open wide. Come, come, now is the day. This is the time. Come, my invitation is for you. Will you please come? I've done it all. I finished the work on the cross. All you have to do now is come. Wow. So second, the godly will not go unrewarded. Two lessons then from Nahum. First, the guilty will not go unpunished. And second, the godly will not go unrewarded. That's the sense, I think, of Nahum. Route 66, as we're cruising through these 66 books of the Bible, today we have focused on the book of Nahum, the structure of the story, the Savior, and the sense. We'll pick it up with the book of Habakkuk when Karen and I return from our mission trip to Thailand. In the meantime, I am sure that you are going to be blessed by Jim as he shares with you over the next three Sundays. Let's pray. Father, thank you once again for your word. It is alive, it is active, it is sharper than any two-edged sword. It goes right to the heart of the matter, and it's done that today. Nahum's message is so loud and so clear. God, I pray that we would understand both edges of this sword, that we would understand that there is no, no sin at all that will go unpunished. Every sin must have the punishment of death because that's how you have designed this whole thing as a just God. But may we also understand that the godly will not go unrewarded, that when we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, when we trust in the finished work of the cross where He took the hit for us, when we allow Him to be our sin-bearer and our substitute, and we embrace by faith what He has done for us when He died in our place, that therein is our hope, and therein is our assurance that we will not go unrewarded. Not because of what we've done. Oh, not at all, but God, because of what You have done in your great mercy and your great love for us. So I would pause right now to pray for any person who is listening to this lesson today who does not know Jesus, that today, this very moment, would be the time that they would surrender their lives and receive that free gift. As Jesus said, come. That invitation is still open right now. Come. Would you just please come? If you're thirsty, come. If you're hungry, come. Because Jesus is the answer. And there are no other answers. There are no other ways. Just this one. The message of Jesus. So speak to hearts and lives right now, I pray, in Jesus' name.